right, everyone. I am excited to continue our study of the book of Esther with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Esther's chapter 7 and 8. We're coming to the conclusion of our study of this incredible book. We'll finish next week, so we're going to cover two chapters today. For the sake of time, I'm just going to read chapter 7, but I'll fill you in on the events of chapter 8, and you can read chapter 8 on your own. But let me go ahead and begin this morning with the reading of God's Word. We'll pray and get into this morning's message. Esther chapter 7. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day... At the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing. And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine, and he went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you are a living God who speaks through a living word. We just pray this morning you would grant us the hearing of faith, that what you want to speak to your people would be received as the word of God. And we pray that it would transform us from the inside out, not imparting to us merely moral instructions on how to live life, but that it would be life in our souls, that you would convert our hearts, our desire, and our will to live lives to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Again, so just a reminder, kind of a recap about the book of Esther. As many of you have probably heard growing up that the book of Esther is primarily about the courageous acts of one young woman and one man and how God used them to subvert the forces of evil. But we're saying the book is primarily about the sovereign grace of God and his faithfulness to the gospel, despite the faithlessness of his people and the plotting of wicked men. So again, if you look at Esther and Mordecai, you will see that while there are some things worthy of emulation, there are a number of things that we should not emulate because they're actually wrong. Now, this is not to put down Esther or Mordecai. What it is to do is to exalt God to exalt the grace of God, to exalt the sovereignty of God. And even when we look at the flaws of Esther and Mordecai and the things that they did wrong, we're also invited to see ourselves and that there's hope for us. In other words, God's grace, by definition, 
is not contingent upon our perfect moral obedience. That's what makes grace good news. Grace would not be grace if you earned it. Grace is precisely the opposite. It's God's goodness towards us when we do not deserve it. And again, grace is such a controversial idea because I think we already sense, even when we hear it, even if you've heard it a million times and you heard it again this morning, we already know that people will try to take negative advantage of that. They'll already see there's sort of a moral dilemma within the biblical concept of grace. If you say grace is not contingent upon moral purity, it's not contingent upon perfect obedience to the Bible or anything else, won't people then just abuse that? Won't they say, well, let's just sin more that grace may abound? Now, those words probably are familiar with those of you who've studied the book of Romans. Paul anticipates that very objection to the idea of grace. Grace is so great that it sounds like license. It actually sounds like, in other words, you don't have a biblical concept of grace if you aren't challenged to ponder whether it could actually serve as permission. That's how great grace is. But as Paul says, certainly not. Because if you've actually received the grace of God, if grace has touched your heart, if you see how gracious and generous, benevolent, kind God has been to you, and how the good things in your life, you didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it, the bad things in your life where maybe you didn't get punished, you did get away with it, whatever, that's not because you earned it or you're better or smarter, more clever than other people. It is because God is generous. God is gracious. And if that gets through that heart of stone and through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, we receive that grace, we're moved to tears, we're moved to rejoicing by grace, then we want sin to be as far from us as we can possibly get. That's the response to grace. So we're seeing grace at work in the lives of the Jewish people who even when they were invited to return to the promised land, the promised land that was given to Abraham and his descendants, and they said, no, we'd rather stay in Persia. We like our earthly life here. We're going to sort of adopt to the pagan culture. We're going to become secularized. We're going to hide our identity. We're going to simply try to do life without God. That's why God's not mentioned a single time in the book of Esther. It's why prayer is not mentioned a single time. It's why the Bible is not mentioned a single time, or the temple, or a sacrifice, or the promised land. They're seeking to live life without God, and that's what highlights the grace of God all the more. God is being faithful even when his people are faithless. That is an incredible, precious promise. So that's the overall context of the book of Esther. But as we follow the story, we arrive in chapters 7 and 8. We marked last week how we saw the beginning of what we called the great reversal. Things that seem to be going exactly the wrong way suddenly begin to turn in chapter 6. In chapter 7 and 8, we have good news and we have bad news. So let's talk about the good news first, and that concerns chapter 7 in particular. So up to this point, there's been a decree issued. Haman manipulated the king in order to signing a decree that all Jews would be annihilated on a particular day. And so Esther has been exercising wisdom. We saw a transformation. And by the way, we should note that faith transforms your character. Faith transforms you. It's not just about, oh, I have faith. I need to believe certain things. Faith is actually transformative. A man or a woman of faith is a certain kind of person. You actually change. And one of the fruits of faith is wisdom. It's no mistake that the book of Esther in the Jewish division of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, it's not a mistake that the book of Esther appears in the Ketuvim, or what many scholars refer to as the wisdom literature. Esther is a book of wisdom, and up until chapter 6, Esther has not demonstrated wisdom. 
Esther has been somewhat foolish. She's hidden her identity as one of the chosen people of God. She's engaged in a situation, relationship with a pagan king that was not becoming a child of God. She's been doing things wrong. Whatever her uncle's been telling her to do, she's just been mindlessly sort of obeying it. But we saw a change take place. Once the Lord seems to be working in her heart and she starts to take steps of faith, she starts to become her own person. We saw a hint of that in chapter 6 when for the first time in the whole book, perhaps in her whole life, instead of her uncle telling her what to do, she tells her uncle what to do. She is emerging as a strong, bold, courageous leader. And Esther is demonstrating wisdom in this leadership. The way she has been approaching the king, talking to the king, the way she is sort of drawing this this request out, this is the third invitation that she's given the king. When she first appeared into the courtroom, the king said, what do you want, Queen Esther? I'll give it to you, up to half the kingdom. What did she say what she really wanted? No. She's priming the pump. She's getting things ready. She doesn't want to say anything apart from the king being present with Haman. She does not want to allow Haman the opportunity to speak into the king's ear when she's not there. This is wisdom. This is very wise. Many times in life when we need to approach people about something serious, maybe there's a conflict, maybe there's a problem, maybe there was some gossip, maybe there were some things going on, and definitely one of the things I've learned both as a parent with the kids and even with my lovely brothers and sisters in the church, sometimes you get one version of the story from one person and you get another version somewhere else and it can be hard to know who to listen to. One of the solutions to that is have the respected parties together in the same room. It's like when I talk to my kids when, the, when there's been a fight in the other room, which by the way, now my Great Dane always breaks up. He breaks up every fight. Every time they try to fight each other, he's like so sensitive and protective. He will run and charge. We have little gates set up. He'll like fly over the gates to try to break up a fight. But when my kids do get the chance to fight, and I ask them, well, hey, who started it? That's like probably the dumbest question I could ask because it's always that person. You know what I mean? It's always they did it, they did it, and it's like, oh. Sometimes in marriage situations, when we're talking about, oh, we're we're having difficulty and all that, if you're talking to one person, you get one version of the story, talk to another person, you get another version of the story, probably my kind of rule of thumb, there's probably some truth on both sides, right? But you try to figure out what exactly is going on. So Esther is demonstrating maturity and wisdom that she does not want to reveal her request to the king apart from Haman being in the same room at the same time. So she says, no, my request will be come to a banquet. So he comes to a banquet the next day. He says again, what's your request? She says, come to another banquet. Oh, and by the way, there's no mistake that this is a banquet, quote, of wine. All the significant things in the book of Esther happen around food and wine. This whole story got started around food and wine. You'll remember the king was showing off all of his wealth. He was having a tremendous party. He was drinking wine. That's when he wanted his ex-wife, the former queen Vashti, to come in and dazzle everyone with her physical beauty. He had been drinking wine. Haman was on his way home when he decided he wanted to impale Mordecai on a 75-foot high gallows, and his heart was merry with wine. So she's setting everything up. She is demonstrating sagacity, wisdom. And God, ultimately, in the Bible, is the source of wisdom. So look at the scene here. This is the third and final time where a banquet will be held and Esther finally reveals her request. Imagine the look on both the king's face and Haman's face. They're at a banquet. Haman thinks things are going good for him up to this point. He went home and boasted to his wife about all his money, all his positions, all his children, and the fact that even the queen asked him and him alone to come to a banquet. He thinks this is the greatest day of his life. Imagine his face and the king's face when she says this. O king, if it pleases you, let my life be given to me 
at my request and my people, for we have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. I mean, just a bomb just went off in that room. That definitely crashed the party right there. You can imagine what is going on. Ahasuerus, who's shown himself to be a man of passion, bursts forth, who is he and where is he who would dare do such a thing? Remember, Haman's right there. Like he's at the table. The king doesn't know it's him. He's had this guy in his midst the whole time. And he thought, hey, this is a good guy to have my back. It's, the enemy was at his table the whole time. And Esther says, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Imagine Haman's face. He's going from jubilation, I'm being invited out of everyone to have a banquet with the king and the queen, to the queen just accused him of an assassination. Imagine what is happening. Everything is falling apart in Haman's life. We saw the beginning of this, of course, when he came to ask permission to the king to impale Mordecai, and instead, he ends up parading Mordecai around, proclaiming that this is a man whom the king delights to honor, so things started going downhill for him. That was the worst thing in life, other than death, that Haman hated most. As we pointed out, he was a man of utter pride, hubris, arrogance. What he wanted more than anything was recognition. He wanted glory. He wanted glory for himself. So to have to give glory to the one man who refused to give him glory would have been the worst thing he could have experienced other than this. His life is now on the line. The king apparently in verse 7 is so angry that he literally has to leave the room. Have you ever been that angry where like you're literally so ticked? I have to go for a walk. I like, I have to get out of this room. Something will get thrown or something will get said and people might regret it. Maybe me, maybe you, whoever. And you're like, you just got to go. He is furious. Remember, he's been drinking wine too. Like, this is not a good, so he's probably like literally fuming, walking in the garden like, and he's probably just bewildered. I mean, think about it. He's, he's got to sort through what I just heard. The guy who's the number two in the whole country who wears my signet ring, this guy used me to plot an assassination against my own wife and made me look guilty of it. Like, I mean, like how, and how could I be so wrong to have this guy sitting at my table and wearing my signet ring? And oh my gosh, my, my wife and I issued a decree, and as you're going to see in a moment... The decrees of the Medes and the Persians could not be revoked. So we're going to have a, a, a logistical dilemma here in a moment. So he's furious. And notice how God in his providence, the fall of Haman just goes down, 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 down in a single day. Though the overall subject matter is of the utmost seriousness, there is some almost comic humor here in verse 7. It says, the king arose in his wrath from the banquet and went into the palace garden. But Haman, so imagine, this guy is panicking. He's losing himself. He's in utter fear. When he saw that evil was determined against him, he's going up to Queen Esther. She's laying on a couch, mind you. Okay, so they would recline at a meal. She's laying on a couch. Haman goes over to like beggar leaning over and then he falls on top of her. Now, back then, especially in the culture of the Persians, you stayed the heck away from the king's wives. They have a separate place called a harem. That's where they lived away from all men except for eunuchs. And you can imagine why he was okay with them. That's the only people that should be around the queen. And he comes back in. He's already deciding, like, this guy's worthy of death. And now he's, like, on top of my wife. And so he is just like, that's it. If, there was, if this guy thought he had any hope that he was going to talk his way out of this, this is over. He says, the king, 
Will he also assault, sexually assault, the queen while I am in the house? Haman has fallen to the proverbial bottom. Right as the king utters this, his guards know what to do. They cover his face. His execution, his death warrant has been signed. The great enemy of the Jews, a type of Satan himself who is the enemy of God's people, a liar and a murderer from the beginning, is going to the gallows. The king says, hang him on it. Again, the irony of the reversal. The very stake that had been prepared for Mordecai the Jew is used to impale Haman the Agagite, the Amalekite, the enemy of God's people. You would think at this point, salvation has come to the people of God. The story is over. We should have just one chapter left talking about how they lived happily ever after. But sort of the main point I want to make for you this morning is the idea that there is such a thing as irreversible evil. Irreversible evil. There's such a thing. I think at a practical level, we understand this. There are certain consequences, effects or results, that follow evil in this world. For example, there's things that you may have done in your past. Maybe you don't do that anymore. But the effects of it are following you to this day. And again, when I say evil, I don't necessarily mean by your standards or mine. Certainly not the culture. They don't know their left hand from their right, unfortunately, in modern Western culture. But we're talking about the standards of God. Sometimes what the Bible says is evil, we don't think is that bad. And yet, nevertheless, we can do things that will alter, humanly speaking, the trajectory of the rest of our lives. I know people, I, I won't say names, I had a high school student in a Bible class. I won't even tell you the gender. This student decided to drink heavily and go driving. This student was driving 95 miles an hour at 2 in the morning down Beach Boulevard. Ran a red light. Hit a young high school graduate who had just gotten a full-ride scholarship to a college for sports. Killed her instantly on impact. That girl, raised in a Christian home, knows the Bible standards, did 12 years in prison. It was the first case in Orange County where they wanted to make an example of people. She had had a DUI prior, nobody was hurt in the accident, she was simply pulled over, but they used the prior DUI as proof of premeditation, second degree murder. They threw the book at her, and she ended up doing years. Now, no matter what Jesus may have done for her while she was in prison, ministered to her heart, converted her, convicted her of her sin, no matter the extent to which she tries to make amends with the family whose daughter is forever in this world lost. The consequences of that evil will follow her the rest of her life. That's the evil she's done. But then imagine the family. The evil, not that they had done, but was done to them, is irreversible. Even if you sort of long for justice in the courtroom, and I From what uh, I read in the articles, the family was, I wouldn't say happy, but they felt vindicated that the charge of second-degree manslaughter stood. They felt like she needed, she took a life from us. But at the same time, does that reverse anything? No, there, there is such a thing as irreversible evil. 
in this world. The Bible even talks about irreversible, eternal evil. And I think sometimes Christians, you think about Jesus, you think about the cross, you think about the gospel, and we kind of get the idea, well, oh, well, sin's reversible. It's actually not. The curse of sin is like the decree of the Medes and the Persians that we are reminded of in chapter 8. Let me fill you in on what happened in chapter 8. So we see more good things happening in chapter 8 following the death of Haman. Everything that belonged to Haman, including his position, was given to Mordecai. Mordecai is now second in command. The signet ring used to sign royal decrees is given to Mordecai. But the decree has already been issued. The Jews are still scheduled to be annihilated. That still remains. So what we see in chapter 8 is Esther comes before the king once again, throws herself down in the ground. She assumes at this point, okay, I'm safe. The king now knows I'm a Jew. Remember, she hid that from her husband. So, and again, he's having to deal with the fact his wife has kind of lied to him, deceived him for a very long time. But she presumes, I'm okay now. He had the enemy of the Jews, Haman hanged. I'm here. He knows I'm a Jew. Okay, I think I'm okay. But she realizes that does not necessarily guarantee the safety of her people. And so it says she throws herself down on the ground and begs that the decree issued for the extermination of the Jews would be reversed. But what does the king say? He says that whatever is written in the king's name, verse 8 of chapter 8, and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So there's a dilemma Things seem to be going the right way for the people of God, and yet there remains an irrevocable decree. There's nothing they can do. It's been done. The effects of this evil are continuing. Reversing it is not an option. So how is God going to deliver his people? How does he redeem an irreversible decree? And the answer in the text is that it is by issuing another decree. This is a decree that would allow the Jewish people to assemble, which may imply they had been forbidden to do so. In the past, they were going to be free to assemble together, to arm themselves, and to prepare to do battle with anyone who would seek their harm. That's the answer. We'll talk about how this ends next week, but that's the solution. There's an irrevocable decree of evil, the consequences of evil. You cannot undo it. The only answer is that the king issues another irrevocable decree, and that is ultimately how the Jewish people will be saved. I think a lot of people don't realize By virtue of sin, there is an irrevocable decree of death on every single one of us. Good news. Happy Sunday. There's an irrevocable decree. And you might think to yourself, well, if I just start going to church, if I just start reading the Bible, if I just, then it'll get reversed. That that irrevocable decree of death will, will be reversed. That's not true. The wages of sin is death. That's an irrevocable decree. It's not going to go away. So what does God do about that? If as a result of our own sin, and yes, we inherit sin from Adam, but then we ourselves each become our own Adam. We can't just blame Adam, right? Like in real life, you can blame your parents. You can blame your family or the lack thereof. And it's not like there's not some truth to that, right? Like if you were raised a bad way, you're raised without a mother or a father, you're raised in abuse. It's not like there's not something there that you can point at. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing as the problem with Adam. I can look back at Adam and say, I was born into this world with a sin nature, and that's not my fault. And that's true. I didn't do that. But what did I do with my freedom to make choices? Did I say, well, because I inherited these problems, I will go the opposite direction. I will do everything right. Actually, what most of 
history looks like, family history, it's like if you grow up in an alcoholic home, the chances are more likely you will be an alcoholic. You, I mean, wouldn't you think the opposite? If you grew up seeing how horrible that is, you think you more than anyone else would not do that. But that's just not the way it normally works. If you come from that, that's probably what you're going to do. Not a guarantee, but that's probably the case. At some point, we all have to take responsibility for the fact that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And therefore, there is an irrevocable decree of death on all of us, physical, relational, and eternal. Believing in Jesus doesn't undo that. I think we have to sit with the weight of that for a moment. We have to realize what the bad news is before the good news is actually even good. The good news is what God has done in Christ is not wave the magic wand like the judge in the courtroom for the young lady I mentioned and said, you know what, we're just going to let this go. That would be, un how do you think the family would have felt? Like we might have said, oh, that's so gracious, judge. You let this girl who decided to drive drunk 95 miles an hour, okay, let's go. you decided to just let her off with a warning. Oh, that was so gracious. How would the family feel? God's in a bit of a dilemma, isn't he? How on the one hand can you be gracious to a sinner who doesn't deserve it and yet condemn the sin and the wrong they've done to other people and the glory of God himself? How do you do that? The answer the Bible gives is the same one the king of Persia gives in Esther by issuing a second irrevocable decree. And that is the decree that God, by the way, through this people. Why is God so interested in preserving these faithless people? Because in and through him, the second irrevocable decree of life will come. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Adam, the Son of Abraham, the Son of David, he will come and he will die the death of the cross, paying for all the sin that we've committed. Somebody has to die. Somebody has to. You cannot revoke it. Jesus comes and dies. And now the second decree is all who trust in him, all who trust in Christ, pass over from death to life. But it is all due to Jesus. It is all due to him. It is only by seeing that we rightly deserve the sentence of death. Because I, I'll be honest, I mean, I think a lot of us don't think we deserve that. And that's because deep down we think we're good people. But if you think you're good, you also have to ask, by what standard do I call something good? And isn't so much of what we call good subjective human, culturally conditioned understandings. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to share my testimony at times now because, like, I, A, I don't see myself as that person anymore, but B, at the time, I just didn't think I was that bad because everyone I was around was worse than me. Really. Like, I still, part of me wants to say I'm not that bad. But if I were just to say, like, blanket things out of nowhere, no context, I'd be like, what the heck? And then I'd say, well, but compared to so-and-so, I'm not that bad. And do you realize that's what everyone does? Everyone. Compared to this group or that group, this person or that person, compared to the way I was raised, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I'm not doing that bad. But that is why we have to look into the perfect law of God. If you want to see what you actually look like, not a caricature, but a portrait, you have to actually look into the law of God, and it shows you who you really are. The Bible says it's not only the things we've done, it's the things we desire to do. There's evil you want to do but you haven't done it for selfish reasons. That's it. If you could get away with it, if you could have, you would have. 
And I can, how many times have I thought I'm a good person because I didn't do X, Y, and Z, and this person did. But the truth is, I didn't want to go to jail, or I, I didn't want to have you know, kids with random people and blah, blah, blah. That was selfish. It wasn't about God. It wasn't about living a holy life. It was just about me not wanting to add needless pain. That was it. For me, my road of pleasure meant avoiding that because even if it's that for a while, I could see, earthly speaking, the pain. That was all about me. Even the good that I did was about me. The Bible exposes that it's our desires. I was reading through the book of Exodus. If you've been following our reading plan, we're going through Exodus, and it's talking about the Ten Commandments, and it's interesting because most of the commandments are external, obvious, social, and outward. But the last one's actually an inward thing. This is interesting, especially when you compare it to other ancient Near Eastern laws, such as um, the, the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, for example. They never talk about anything internal. They don't talk about motive. For them, they're pragmatic, like politicians. We don't care why you're doing it. We just want you to do this. But when you get down to the 10th commandment, what is it? What are you not supposed to do? Covet. How would I know if you're coveting? How would you know what I'm coveting? How, how do you know? Most of the time, that's invisible. You don't see it. You don't know. But it can move within you. It can compel your actions. It can direct your life. You can make choices of where you're going to go, what you're going to do, what career you're going to choose, what school you're going to go to, what kind of people you're going to surround yourself with, because you're covetous. That's the nature of your heart. You desire what other people have. That's what compels and directs your life. I know this has always been a temptation. It's in a book that's thousands of years old, right? But in the modern social media age, I think more and more studies are coming out about how it really stirs up covetousness. Besides the fact that it also induces depression, because most people on the, on the internet, on social media, don't show you how horrible things are going for them. Right? You don't go, man, I'm miserable today. Look at this. I'm, I'm just angry and I'm ticked off and I'm miserable. Here's a picture. Like, no, nobody does that. You show, oh, we're at the game. We're having the time of our lives. Oh, we're in Vegas. We're doing this. Oh, we're... You don't show the low points. You don't show all the in-betweens, which for most people is most of the time. But besides the depression portion, it also creates covetousness. People showing off their wealth showing off their collection of cars, showing off all these things that they're doing and other people see them and they say to themselves, that should be mine. Why did they get to do that and not me? What gives them the right to have a happy life? Why did they get to marry a great spouse and I got this crumb? Why did they get, why, why did they get that car? It goes zero to 60 in 2.3 seconds. Mine only does it in 4.3. You know, like, what's going on? Injustice. Imagine all the covetousness that's under. And the Bible is saying that if any of that is found in us, we're sinners. And sin is so bad, not when we compare it to others, not when we compare it even to our own standards, but when we compare it to God's, we fall utterly and entirely short. We're worthy of death. And the answer is not to reverse the curse of evil, but rather to issue a decree of life. So number one, in terms of application, the most important thing in the world to know is that the problem in the world, and if it's the problem in the world, it's the problem in your life, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing in the world. If death, like even for Haman, other things mattered more until his life was on the line. Being number one, having wealth, having a family, all that mattered a lot until the moment he saw his life about to be extinguished. Then, like Satan said to God regarding Job's skin for skin, all that a man has he will give to save his skin. 
In the end, doesn't matter how much money you have. You could be a multi-billionaire, but in that moment, and you believe you've just got moments to live, months to live, hours to live, that's all that matters. You suddenly realize death and dealing with death is the most important practical thing in all the world. Yet we spend so much of our lives pretending like it won't happen. But if we can be realists for a moment, and that's what the Bible's asking for, realists. Not people with their head in the clouds like some people say. I I think the very fact that the center of our faith is the death of someone on a cross, like the Bible is dealing with man's greatest problem. That should be clear and obvious. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are, where you come from, what your socioeconomic status is, doesn't matter. All those little categories, doesn't matter. Death is the great leveler. Everyone deals with it. And the gospel is God's decree of life. And it's by faith in him that the problem in all the world, the greatest problem in our life, is dealt with. But secondly, I also think that even if we believe in Christ, there's remaining issues we deal with. And one of the things is that the effects of evil, they do continue in our lives. We can can believe in God and we're promised eternal life. When we die, yet shall we live. But once again, like the young lady who now has manslaughter on her permanent record, she will have to learn to live with that the rest of her life. And the problem with that is you can feel like that's going to stop you from doing what God wants you to do in the future. But besides eternal life, with respect to the life we are now living, whatever you've done in the past, if you're beating yourself up every day saying, well, I can't live the life God wants me to live because of the past. Because I did this thing or that thing, because I failed to do this, I failed to do that, I should have gotten married, I shouldn't have gotten married, I should have had kids, I shouldn't have had kids, I should have gone to this school, I shouldn't have gone to that one. I mean, all those would have, should have, and you're living your life backwards. Life's compelling you to move forward, but you're looking backwards your whole life because you feel like these effects of evil are sovereign over your life, and God can't get you where he wants you to go. But the message of Esther is God is able to redeem even the effects of sin and evil in our lives, such that they work together for the glory of God. Now, the Jewish people, even if they were faithless, they had a faithful God who had made a promise in the Old Covenant. But we today have an equal, I'd even say better promise in Christ. And this is where Romans 8.28 comes in as a true statement for God's people. And we know that all things, and think about what we've been saying, the bad things, evil you've done and evil done to you, all things, those things work together for what? Good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. The idea that whatever regret you have, if you're allowing regret to be sovereign in your life, and again, we want remorse, we want repentance, we want confession, and where possible, make amends. We're We're not speaking against that. But deep down, ultimately, life is about you and God. And the regret that we have for things we had or didn't have in the past are not greater than God's love for you. God can take whatever you bring him, whether it would be considered an asset or a liability, doesn't matter. Because God is who he is. And his grace is greater than any evil or effective evil we could bring to him. And if we'll do that by faith, he can work redemptively in our lives to bring about his desired will, just like he did in the faithless lives of those Israelites remaining in Persia. That's the good news for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you again that you are a good and gracious God. You are entirely holy and just, so you must punish sin, but we thank you that you sent Christ to pay the penalty for all of our sin So that the decree of life, not death, defines your people now. Lord, I just pray that you would bring a freedom 
in the spirit to hearts today, to those who feel plagued and cursed and haunted, whether it's by the reality of physical death in this world or even the effects and consequences of sin and evil. Lord, we just pray that we would, by faith, recognize, experience, and enjoy the fact that you are sovereign over all of these things. And so, Lord, again, out of deep, heartfelt gratitude, let us repent of anything that is simply not befitting a child of God. Not out of guilt, because Christ paid for our guilt, but out of gratitude, with joy. Let us surrender anything in our lives that we should not be or should not do. And Lord, we know you don't want empty vessels. You want to fill us, and we will be filled with something. It'll either be desires for the world, or it will be desires for your kingdom. So we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Place within us a longing for your kingdom. Help us to to desire to do your will, to do the things which please you. And Lord, I just pray that your people, your children here today, your sons and daughters, would experience the gracious and glorious freedom of the decree of life in Christ. Though the verdict of death has been leveled against us by sin and by the great adversary of our souls, so Christ, our advocate, is granting us life. We pray that you would grant it to us today and that more abundantly. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.